Yeah. Thanks. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Jim Golding Institute, we're also known as the JGI. We are a central hub for data science, AI, and data intensive research. We are one of five University of Bristol research institutes, and we aim to connect multidisciplinary experts across the university and beyond. And we're partnered with the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. We also hold a range of events throughout the year, including Bristol Data Week. It's an interactive program of speakers, training and workshops. And this year will be taking place from the 5th to the 9th of June inclusive. It's open to everyone, including external people to the university, and it's completely free of charge. So please do come along. We also have seed corn funding you can apply for every year, and the application process will open in the autumn. Here you can see some of our previous seed corn funding winners that were able to pursue their projects with our funding. We hold a regular data ethics club, which is a discussion group about practicing data science ethically. This involves reading parts of blog posts, books, or videos, and discussing different themes and issues to do with ethics in data science and AI. We also have a regular Bristol data visualization group where members can share skills, discuss data visualization topics, and highlight different examples. In addition, we run an Ask JGI consultancy service where we offer free assistance with data science queries from all schools and faculties. So you can literally ask a data scientist your question via our mailbox, ask-jgi at bristol.ac.uk, and we'll do our best to help you if we can. So here's a reminder of all the ways you can connect with us by subscribing to our newsletter, visiting our website and blog, following our Twitter account or LinkedIn page, or coming to one of our in-person events. So it's great to welcome you all on this International Women's Day event. I hope you're keeping warm wherever you are. Um, this year, the theme is Embrace Equity a vision of a gender equal world free of biases, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that's diverse, equitable and inclusive, where difference is valued and celebrated. We hope that this event is an opportunity to celebrate the achievements and talented women working in our international community in the area of data science and AI. And we have some exciting presentations lined up for you today and a range of speakers from our partner institutions, as you can see from this slide. Here's a quick reminder to enter any questions and comments during the presentation into the chat box or via Slido by navigating to slido.com and entering this code. Um, so first we'll listen to the presentations from each speaker and then We'll have an opportunity to pose questions and answers to the whole panel of speakers following all of the presentations. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Sarah Taylor Knight is from Liverpool, Victoria equals general insurance. Sarah attended Bristol University in 2016 to study engineering mathematics. During her degree, she helped to run a number of summer schools, including one where she heard more about data science from a number of speakers, including speakers from the JGI and Liverpool Victoria Equal General Insurance's data science team. On completion of her degree, she joined the Liverpool Victoria Equals General Insurance team on a research internship, after which she took a full-time role as a data scientist. So welcome, Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much for having me at this, this really awesome event. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, as mentioned, I my background is in engineering. Um, so what I'm going to kind of talk to everyone about a little bit today is my route from kind of into engineering and then across into data science. I hope nobody minds the slightly uh, cheesy pun of belonging to a minority distribution there. But coming from an engineering background, I've always been in a, in a minority position, as I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. And it's definitely something that has been a, a big uh, factor of my kind of journey in. 
So if Jodie, you could click onto the next slide, please. So my route uh, into data science is not quite, has not been quite as uh, straightforward as this slide makes it look. Um, but the kind of overview is when I was a young, very young child, I, I think I was obsessed for tur with turtles for some reason, which meant, you know, marine biologist, dead set on that. And I was really fortunate when I was young that I had very strong role models in, you know, my parents, my family and my surroundings that I never felt like that was something that was unattainable to me. And I know that I'm in a very privileged position of being there that is not necessarily true for everyone on this call and everyone kind of in our industries. It wasn't until I started going down the route of engineering, looking at very maths heavy A-levels and going into, into university that it became clear that not everybody thought that my goals were particularly realistic in all cases. Doing my engineering degree was not necessarily the most uh, streamlined process. I actually didn't uh, get the grades required to go to university at first, but uh, anyone who knows me knows I am a very stubborn person. And partly through spite, I decided that I was going to, to get into university. I was going to do the degree that I wanted to do. And again, although not everybody necessarily thought that that was the right decision for me to make. The people closest to me always had my, my kind of back in that. And in the end, after taking a year out, resitting a few exams, I came back to Bristol University and studied my engineering maths degree. Um, this was an incredibly uh, fascinating degree to study. We did lots and lots of different pieces, picking up different engineering uh, kind of disciplines. I quite frequently refer to it as a magpie degree. We stole all the shiny bits and pieces from all of the other uh, engineering degrees and departments. And something I really noticed there was my degree, although you know an unbalanced cohort, I think probably about 30% women, when we were with aerospace, mechanical engineers, or sometimes the, the computer science students, that uh, difference became even more exaggerated in those different areas. And I really kind of realized how crucial it was that that was something I wanted to change. And that was something I wanted to kind of be a force for changing. So while I was at university, I became involved in a lot of the outreach work that um, Bristol University does, including helping run some summer schools for young girls, getting them into the field of engineering. And at a later point in my degree, including data science. This was my first real interaction with data science. And as Kiara mentioned at the start, I met a few speakers from uh, the Gene Golding Institute, including uh, Natalie, who will be speaking to us later today. And it was through that experience that I became so kind of aware of the amazing potential of data science as a field and as an industry. And the reason I got into engineering was I liked the idea of being able to solve a problem be able to take something apart, put it back together, but better. And I realized that, okay, data science, you don't do that practically, but you do do that. You're using numbers and data to play with a problem and solve it. And after that experience, I then went on to uh, apply for a three month research internship with LV, which I'll talk about in a, in, a, in a little minute, but that was again, a really amazing experience for me. I found it incredibly interesting, met some really great people. And the opportunity of doing that was uh, not something I'd ever have got if it weren't for various features, including the Gene Golding Institute. It's not something I'd have ever applied for. So that was the summer of 2020, very tumultuous time for all of us. Um, but ever since that, I have stayed with the team and continued being involved in events like these and work where I can really give back to a community that has not necessarily always been the easiest to get involved with, but ha is so important for us to get more women, young girls, anyone of any kind of, um, any minority distribution to really get involved in this field because we all have so much potential and value that we can bring to this field. And I think stressing that is so crucial. And that's why events like these are so important. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, 
please. I think you've heard uh, enough about my story. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the LV data science team. So as a team, we do so many different things. Two of the focuses that I've kind of pulled out here are our use case work and our research work that I'll get into in detail in a second. But also we do work on best practice, on uh, really contributing to the, the data science, like the global data science community. Uh, so it wouldn't be right for me to come on this and not plug one of our uh, open source Python patch packages that we have made as a team and sort of released into the wider world. Um, it's called Tubular um, and it's essentially a data pre-processing package. So that's a stage in any data scientist's work that is incredibly crucial and can sometimes be really fiddly. But uh, Tubular is something that we used as a team and massively helped us. And it was only right that we really shared that with the open source community. So it's, it's something we're incredibly proud of. And what I think we're most proud of is the fact that we're getting contributions from all over the place, people really kind of getting involved and it's becoming a proper community project. So moving on from the shameless plug, uh, if Jody, you could click on, I'll talk a little bit about the use cases that we do as a team. So for anybody who doesn't know, LV is an insurance company, predominantly home and motor. Uh, it's the green car advert I'm sure you'll have seen if you watch much daytime TV. Um, but as part of that, we work with teams across pretty much the whole company. So you probably, uh, most people probably know less uh, pricing and uh, insurance knowledge than I have seen uh, acquired in my job. Um, but there's a lot more departments involved in an insurance company than you might expect. And almost all of them are now using machine learning um, solutions as a result of the work that we've done. And being exposed to such a wide community of people with different different workloads, different requirements, and different backgrounds has been really fascinating for me, learning how different people interact with AI and how we can make sure that the AI that we are making and the machine learning models that we create are improving the work for people across the company. If you can move on to the next slide, please, I'll talk a little bit about the research that we do as well, because that's another major component of what we do as a team are strongly linked with uh, the University of Bristol. In fact, we have an office that is based out of one of the university buildings, which is where I'm normally based, uh, currently at home, hiding from the snow. Um, and as part of that, we've done lots and lots of really cutting edge research projects in conjunction with that, the university. So um, just to name a couple, we've looked at synthetic data, we're looking at cutting edge of AI ethics. Um, we have, I believe three PhD and postdoc students that we are sponsoring and really benefiting from all of the work that they're doing alongside working with master's students and uh, master's projects. That sort of leads me nicely onto the, the next slide where I can talk about the project that I did for my internship. So when I did my internship, I had um, finished my final year at university and was looking for something that was more kind of data science-y, but still wasn't too far away from the academic world that I had been in for the last four years. Um, and as, as a part of that, I was introduced to this concept of conformal intervals or conformal predictors. Technically, they're slightly different, but I tend to use the terms slightly interchangeably. Conformal intervals are essentially a tool that you can use to predict uncertainty. Whenever we make a data science model, one of the evaluations that you do at the end is you get sort of a global performance metric. What, what metric you use depends on, you know, who you're making the model for, what the model is, all that kind of stuff. But it just gives you a global view. The idea of conformal intervals is that you can really drill down into the individual predictions that you're making and get some insight into those specific predictions, which ones are going to be more accurate, which ones you're more certain of, and there's so many decisions that can come off the back of that. And there's so many different ways that we're looking to apply this kind of in the team, which has been amazing to see. When I was doing this, I was working with, um, with the team. You know, I was working on an independent project um, that was supervised by a couple of members of the team, but I was still interacting with people 
in all different areas across the teams. I was introduced to a data engineer for the first time, um, having had very little exposure to that kind of type of work. Um, and I found it really, really fascinating, um, this, this side of things. And none of that would have come if it wasn't for this project. And in fact, uh, very recently, I have been a, an industrial supervisor for a master's student who was doing their master's thesis on conformal intervals, which was a very, very surreal kind of full circle moment for me. But it's something that I never would have thought I would ever do in my wildest dreams. But really, for me, I think I want to just move on to if you could click on once more, Jodie, I have to talk about the highlight of this experience for me, which was um, presenting at a company wide forum, which meant that anyone across the company with any kind of background could come along and talk about conformal intervals, which, of course, given that opportunity, I had to make it about dogs. So as part of this presentation, I was presenting to a very wide audience about conformal intervals at a very high level, and then going into exactly how these work by talking about the LV K9 talent show. And it was an amazing experience uh, presenting, but the thing that I really took away from it was having people from across the company message me of, oh, I didn't really know anything about data science, but that was fascinating. It's a really interesting idea how about using this in this particular area of the business? And it really opened my eyes to how many people, when exposed to this kind of stuff, can really see how it can be implemented in ways that, as a data science team, we don't always think about. Now, I, uh, I think that's, that's all from me. As I said, that's, it's been an absolutely amazing experience. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that presentation. It was amazing to hear about your journey um, going from an intern to, to a supervisor, industrial supervisor, what you're doing now. And it's really nice to hear that kind of full circle moment of you speaking to Natalie at the beginning and now you're presenting with Natalie. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very surreal. I'm still slightly pinching myself. Yeah, yeah, good on you. Brilliant. Well, um, please continue to put your questions in the chat. I've got a few for you about the K9 show and other things, but I will hold back. And um, I'll move on to our next speaker, Ayaka Sakata from the Institute of Statistical Mathematics based in Tokyo, Japan. And thank you very much for joining us, Ayaka, because I'm aware your time zone is very different. So it's probably the evening where you are now. And so Ayaka obtained her PhD from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the University of Tokyo in 2011, where her research focused on the intersection of statistical physics and biophysics. Following her PhD, Dr. Sakata held the position um, of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, also known as JSPS, Research Fellow at Tokyo Institute of Technology, from April 2011 to March 2014. During this time, she was engaged in research on various projects related to statistical physics, information science, and machine learning. After her tenure as a JSPS research fellow, Dr. Sikata moved on to Riken as a special postdoctoral researcher, where she held the position of researcher from April 2014 to March 2015. And then in April 2015, Dr. Sakata took on the role of assistant professor at the Institute of Statistical Mathematics, or ISM, where she continued to conduct research on statistical physics and statistical machine learning. She held this position until March 2020, and then in April 2020, she was promoted to associate professor at ISM. She currently holds this position where she continues to contribute to the field through her research and teaching. So welcome, Ayaka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for our introduction. I'm Ayaka Sakata from the Institute of Statistical Mathematics. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Since today's presentation is on International Women's Day, I'd like to talk about my path into the world of research and my research to date. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, 
I'm working as an associate professor at the Institute of uh, Statistical Mathematics and Sokendai, which is an affiliated university for PhD course uh, since 2020. Okay. Go to next slide. Okay. My research spans statistical physics, statistics, information science, machine learning, and biological evolution. Although these fields are seemingly not barely related, but they are similar in terms of their mathematical expressions. The mathematical similarity means that mathematical method in one field can be applied to another, and problems in one field can lead to the discovery of new problems in another. As for my personal background, I studied my research in physics, so I'll briefly explain why I chose physics and my journey into biophysics, information science, and machine learning. Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, I attended a Catholic school from junior high school to high school, although I'm not a Catholic. This chart shows the school curriculum. The school placed a strong emphasis on volunteer and charity activities. <coughs> Sorry. And I went to various facilities for volunteer activities at school events. For example, I went to facility for disabled people, for the elderly people, and the sanatorium for people suffering from leprosy known as Hansen's disease. And since there was an affiliated women's university, most students were expected to go there at that time. Uh, I counted my friend on Facebook and, uh, sorry, uh, some, some texts are vanishing, sorry. Uh, this chart means that roughly 70% of students went to the affiliated university. But I applied to another, another university that had a school of science and gained admission based on recommendation. In general, to pass the university entrance examination is the most serious problem for high school students. But I and most of my friends does not have such experience. So uh, I cannot talk about the difficulties that female students had when they choose a particular measure as if it were my own. For example, I've heard some from those around me that they were discouraged by advice such as science is not suitable for girls. But fortunately, I have not had that experience. Go to the next slide. I enrolled in physics department, although I didn't have a strong interest in many topics in physics, such as relativity, astrophysics, and particle physics. The reason I chose physics was because I was fascinated by using mathematics to uh, describe things. And at that time, physics was the only high school subject that applied mathematics to explain various phenomena. However, nowadays, Japanese high school curricula also includes subjects like statistics and information science. So I might have followed a uh, different path if I were in high school right now and had more knowledge about these topics. Okay, go to next slide. In fact, I didn't have, I didn't, uh, sorry. Okay. So I'll skip. As I already mentioned, I'm not much interested in uh, typical physics topics. So I went to a university where the application of physics to another research field was emphasized. The university specialized in uh, medical or biological sciences, and there were lectures in biology and biophysics. Through this encounter with biophysics, uh, I became interested in describing biological systems mathematically. At that time, I learned 
statistical physics, which had a big impression on me. One of the goals in statistical physics is to describe macroscopic phenomena in terms of the stochastic behavior of microscopic elements. For example, water is a liquid at room temperature but becomes a solid at about zero degrees Celsius. This kind of change of state is called phase transition and was originally studied in some dynamics where macroscopic observation is the only approach to understanding phase transition phenomena. After developing the kinetic theory of molecules, researchers started to uh, understand uh, macroscopic phase transition using mathematical expressions by microscopic molecules. And nowadays, it's considered that cooperative behavior of microscopic molecules is essential for the phase transition phenomena. And in general, biological organisms consist of many types of compounds. And this high complexity prevents us from constructing mathematical theories to explain their behavior. Some physicists have attempted to describe some phenomena in biological systems, such as protein folding from a statistical physics point of view. In statistical physics, a uh, coarse grain description, in other words, abstraction leads to a universal understanding of various phase transition phenomena. So I thought that it might be possible to find some universal properties in biological systems by using a coarse-grained biological model rather than the detailed model used to describe specific phenomena. Okay, go to the next slide. So in my master and PhD course, I conducted a statistical physics-based study of biological evolution. I focused on the evolution of robustness, which is a property that allows an organism to study a stably express, uh, stably express its function even under mutational or uh, environmental noise. I used a mathematical model to investigate uh, under what condition robust organisms evolve. As a result, I found that the effect of temperature is fairly important. The temperature affects the degrees of randomness in the process of phenotypic expression, and I found that evolution in an environment with intermediate randomness leads to robustness. This uh, figure shows the temperature region where the evolution of robustness is attained in our model. And through these studies, um, I became aware that the theory of biological evolution is similar to machine learning problems. The correspondence here is that in both areas, function-based learning using fitness or loss function is considered. In general, in mathematical expression of evolution, uh, biological systems change to increase fitness which quantifies the adequacy of the biological organism under given environmental conditions. In machine learning, uh, some probabilistic models are changed to decrease some uh, cost function or loss function. Therefore, if the loss function is regarded as the fitness multiplied by minus one, a theory for learning can be applied to biological evolution. This let me into research on machine learning problems. Go to the next slide. After the PhD course, I studied researching machine learning and related problems in information science. My motivation for studying machine learning was the application to biological evolution. However, I realized that physics and mathematics in machine learning are uh, interesting in their own light. And I wanted to continue more related research. 
Uh, these papers are the result of my research during my post period. For example, we found a phase transition phenomenon in the matrix factorization problem under the sparsity assumption. This figure is a phase diagram that shows the Promethean region where learning is feasible within a reasonable computational time or infeasible. This research on Machine learning connected me to the Institute of Statistical Mathematics. Okay, go to the next slide. Before joining the ISM, ISM uh, I had never given any particular thought about thought to statistics. Uh, I thought statistical physics and statistics were the same thing because the formulas are similar. For this, I would like to apologize to, pro apologize to professors who hired me at that time. After coming to ISM, I learned the philosophy of statistics and the statistical culture broadened the scope of my research. The differences between modeling in statistics and in natural sciences are quite impressive to me. In general, uh, problems in natural sciences have a uh, ground truth. In natural sciences, research is conducted uh, from the standpoint that there is a target, which is nature, that should be explored. Therefore, whether or not an assumed mathematical model is valid can be confirmed by conducting experiments. On the other hand, Data on human society does not necessarily have any true roles. So modeling in statistics is to create suitable model for explaining a rule behind data that does not necessarily have true physical laws. And the suitability of the model cannot be quantified by experiment. In statistics, a uh, lot of mathematical efforts <coughs> It is devoted to determining the suitability of models. So this was reason for me, enough for me to want to study uh, more about statistics. In fact, I personally uh, don't have much need to stick to statistical physics, but I like to explore the possibilities of the relation between uh, these fields. Uh, statistical physics calculation corresponds to correspond to influence on probabilistic graphical model in statistics. And they also have the advantage of uh, being able to deal with parameter lesions beyond the asymptotic region of conventional statistics. Okay, go to the next slide. Currently, I'm working on a statistical machine learning and related topics. Uh, you may be uh, under the impression that I was getting further and further away from biophysics, but I haven't forgotten about it and still do uh, some research for, uh, from time to time. Here are uh, some recent papers, and recently a phenomenon called dimensional reduction has been observed in biological systems. We can observe that biological systems often show a uh, similar responses to various perturbations as shown in this figure. Even though the number of uh, possible responses is extremely large. From the experimental study, it is considered that there are manifold-like structures in the phenotype space of the biological systems and possible expressions are restricted to these structures. Forming an understanding of low dimensionality in the high dimensional space is what statistics and machine learnings are good at. So some attempts are shown in our paper. Also, in an effort to connect statistics and statistical physics, I've recently been teaching a course on graphical models at uh, Sokendai and Tokyo Institute of Technology. I believe that 
probabilistic graphical models are at the intersection of the uh, these two fields, statistics and statistical physics. So I'm giving lectures in the hope that the number of people specializing in this field will increase. And the connection between research areas will be tightened. In the 1980s, uh, when books began uh, when books began to uh, be published on graphical models, the language of statistical physics was already being used. For example, the partition function was commonly used. And I assume that researchers at that time found this correspondence useful. At least in Japan, there are not many people working on uh, these research topics, so I would like to nurture human resources to take on this task. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, in summary, uh, today I talked about my research career, including why I chose it. I have been conducting my research without a strong awareness of my female attributes. This is because, fortunately, I have never been discouraged from doing what I would like to do because of being a woman. This comfortable atmosphere has come as a result of the struggles of women in the past, for which I am grateful. I need to I need to pass this environment to the next generation. I think this kind of experience depends a lot on uh, people around you and the field you measured in and your personality. So, in fact, I believe that even today there are people who are prevented from freely choosing their career paths because they are women. I, it, it does not uh, help them to accept my fortunate example as the normal case. So I hope you will accept today's story as an example only. only. Uh, I would like to present myself as an uh, example of successful female researchers so as to inspire other women who wish to follow a similar career path. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ayaka. Thank you very much. And you are inspiring. And thank you for sharing your story. It's fascinating hearing about the evolution of your research and to see data science from a more of a physics and statistical angle. So thank you very much for that. We do have some questions in the chat. So I will keep those in my mind for after the presentations. And please do keep the questions coming. Um, we will move on to Chakaya Nyamvula from iLab Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya. So Chakaya is a highly skilled and driven business intelligence analyst with a passion for using data to drive business decisions. Ms. Chakaya has a strong background in Python programming and is interested in the application of machine learning in the field of business intelligence. She is a graduate of Strathmore University and holds a bachelor's degree in computer science. At iLab Africa, where she works as a business intelligence analyst, her expertise in Python and business intelligence allow her to develop automated reports and dashboards that help her company make more informed decisions. Ms. Chikaya's interest in machine learning has led her to explore the applications of artificial intelligence in business intelligence. She has attended several conferences and workshops to deepen her knowledge and stay up to date on the latest trends in the field. During her time at iLab, she has managed to work on various projects in different fields, such as health and politics. And she is a self-motivated individual who believes there is nothing impossible for one who truly enjoys working in a team of talented people. She enjoys spreading her knowledge by teaching others the importance of data analysis and helping to inspire the next generation of data professionals. So over to you, Chikaya. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So as she said, my name is Chikaya Nyambula and I work as a business intelligence analyst at Strathmore University and I Love Africa. 
And so this, this presentation will basically be a female perspective of data science, uh, my journey into data science, uh, my challenges and my the rewards that I have experienced working as a BI analyst and the research projects that I have worked on and my various interests. So my data science journey started in 2018 when I joined uh, Strathmore University to pursue my uh, bachelor, bachelor of Science in Informatics and Computer Science. So before I decided to do computer science, I was a jack of all trades. So I was interested in very many fields. There's a point in my life I wanted to be a doctor. Another point I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, another point I wanted to be an engineer, an aeronautical engineer. I even wanted to be a photographer at one point and got myself a camera and started taking photos. So how I ended up choosing computer science is uh, the point where we were meant to decide the courses that we'll do in university. Software engineering was the big word in the market. So I thought, okay, why not try, try out software engineering? So that's how I decided to do informatics and computer science. And when once I joined um, the course, uh, I was I was shocked. So first of all, my class was thirty percent male. I mean, sorry, thirty percent female and seventy percent male. So it was quite intimidating. And then also, it was a bit. I found it a bit difficult. So I was stressed for most of my first year, second year. Then around my third year, I in twenty twenty that is, I decided to do the certificate course in data science that is offered at I Love Africa. And that's why I fell in love with data and I fell in love with data science. So it was a three months course. And by the end of the three months, I knew that I had found my, I will say calling. So from 2020 onwards is when I started to venture into the data science field, into uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and uh, as of right now, I'm very glad that I made that choice to do the certificate in data science. So my two choices were either to do a certificate in data science or a certificate in networking. So whatever made me to choose data science, I am grateful for that. So in 2021, I was able to land an internship at uh, iLab Africa still as a junior BI analyst. So that internship kind of solidified my decision to be to join the field in data science. So I did that for a year and 2022, that's last year, I managed to uh, secure a job as a BI analyst still at I Love Africa. And that is what I am currently doing till date. So 2023 onwards, we don't know what the future holds, but I'm sure it's going to be bigger and better. So, uh, next slide, please. So uh, as a female uh, in the data science field, I have experienced some rewards and I've also experienced some challenges. So some of the rewards that I've experienced is that the data science field has given me a chance to grow and develop my career as a female in the data science field. Uh, something else that is very rewarding in this uh, field is that it's very flexible. So by flexibility, I mean, uh, you can venture into data science as a whole, uh, gives you an opportunity to venture into different, um, let me say aspects. So you can do data analysis, you can do, you can be a data engineer, you can be a machine learning engineer, you can do BI, uh, you can be a business intelligence analyst like I am doing. And also it gives you a chance to uh, try out different fields. So uh, you can do, you can be in health, you can be in politics, you can be in uh, entertainment. So any field uh, that you want to join in data science, there's always data. So as I say, data is the new oil. So in any field that you join, you'll be able to um, use your skills in data science. So another reward of working in data science is that the social aspect of uh, the impact that you can do or that you can make using data. So for example, uh, if you're into climate change, you can do things like flood mapping, drought mapping. Uh, if you're into health, you can do some health analytics and using by doing this um, projects, you will be able to uh, change the 
society in an impactful way and um, yeah, make positive changes in the society. So we have, I have experienced some challenges, but I will talk about them in terms of opportunities and not challenges per se. So uh, data science or tech in general being a male dominated space can be quite challenging to uh, venture into the field. But in my experience, in the few years that I have been in the field, it has come to my attention that despite it being a male-dominated space, uh, STEM in general, so that science, technology, engineering, and math, being male-dominated, if you have the skills, you can, you will be able to uh, penetrate into the field. So despite it being male-dominated, there is a chance for anybody who has who is skilled. So because you are rewarded uh, based on merit and not uh, whether your your gender or anything. So that is what that's my experience of being in the data science field, and also because more females are joining the data science field, the AI field, machine learning, uh, you're also, you're also able to get uh, role models or mentors who can work with you through your journey. So in my work of place, there are many females who are in the data science field. So these are females that I look up to that uh, guide me whenever I'm stuck in anything and show me the way. So next slide, next slide please. So my interest uh, in the data science field will be business intelligence. So this uh, basically, involves data mining, uh, data analytics, uh, data storytelling, dashboarding and reporting. Then we also have artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I'm interested in doing predictive analytics and doing natural language processing and computer vision. And then so far, the few projects that I have worked in I have worked on, sorry, I, uh, sports analytics. So naturally I'm not a sports, a huge sports fan. But because of this field, I have been exposed to the sports world and the sporting uh, uh, scene. So I have been able to work on a few projects on the sports analytics. Um, there's also health analytics. So my background is in computer science. I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea anything to do with health and medicine. But being in this field has given me a chance and an opportunity to venture into the health space. Yeah. So uh, speaking on sports analytics, we'll be having a webinar next week, Friday on sports analytics. So you're free to join. Uh, next slide, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jakaya. Brilliant presentation and um, really interesting to hear about the women supporting other women. So mentorship and role models. So I would like to ask you more about that at the end of the uh, presentations. So now we move on to um, Maria Ogamba from iLab Africa also, based in Nairobi, Kenya. So Maria is a dynamic and driven business intelligence analyst who is currently pursuing a master's in data science and analytics. With a passion for leveraging technology to drive business success, Maria has built a reputation as a skilled problem solver able to turn data into actionable insights that drive growth and efficiency. After completing her bachelor's degree in informatics and computer science, Maria started her career as a business intelligence analyst at iLab Africa. Her expertise in Microsoft Power BI and Python programming has been instrumental in her ability to translate complex data into easy to understand visualizations. In her current role, Maria is responsible for leading data analysis and reporting for multiple research projects. She also leads the Smart Academy, an initiative to mentor and share knowledge with future data scientists. Her interest in machine learning led her to enroll in a master's program in data science and analytics, where she is deepening her skills in data modeling, predictive analytics, and computational statistics. In her free time, Maria is an avid reader of data science blogs and articles and enjoys exploring new algorithms and techniques in her personal projects. Over to you, Maria. 
Uh, thank you very much for the, the introduction. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Maria. I'm also a BI analyst working with Chakaya at iLab Africa here in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I think I can get into giving a brief overview of my journey into data science. We can go to the next slide. So I joined Strathmore University and pursued my degree in informatics and computer science. Uh, the reason why I chose computer science was because I wanted something that was a bit more tech based, but still had an aspect of mathematics because um, growing up, I've always been interested in math and I wanted to see if I could be able to combine the two. So I decided to do uh, my computer science degree. Uh, once I completed that, I was able to get an internship at ILAP Africa as a junior analyst. Uh, I got interested in data science when I first encountered um, AI and machine learning back in my informatics and computer science degree. And when I was doing my, uh, my undergraduate project, which was on sentiment analysis, I decided I wanted to further pursue data science. So that's when I got the opportunity to join I Love Africa. And after that, I was able to also get the opportunity to join them full-time as a BI analyst. Uh, aside from being a BI analyst, I also lead the Smart Academy, which uh, is an initiative to mentor as well as provide uh, guidance for the, for the future data scientists or data analysts that we have here, uh, focusing on the students at Strathmore University, but it's also open to all students from various universities in Kenya. So I chose to do my master's in data science and analytics uh, with a focus on computational statistics, because as much as I was able to do a lot of self-teaching, I felt I needed to further my education so that I could understand uh, data science more in depth and to also diversify all that I've learned so far. So I can talk a bit more about the research that I have done. So that will be in the next slide. So currently um, working on projects on healthcare uh, chatbots. So this will be a mental health chatbot that will enable um, maybe, for example, if someone would like to uh, <clears throat> to access mental health uh, information, the chatbot will be able to do that. So we'll be incorporating natural language processing into that. Aside from that, I'm also working on a project on AI in agriculture, where we are seeing if we can be able to give farming and weather advisory to farmers here in Kenya. So my, I will say my main research interests are natural language processing and computer vision. I would like to uh, maybe in the future specialize in machine learning as someone with a computer science background, I felt to, to be a bit more easier for me to venture into that. Yeah. So I will say so far in my experience as a uh, as a woman in data science has been quite good. Uh, I think when I first joined my undergraduate degree, there was that gender imbalance. But once I joined the data science field, I realized there are a lot more women in the space. And I was very grateful to have that because even getting that mentorship was much easier because in this field, it's very good for you to have that sort of, um, let's say teamwork and men mentorship so we can all work together to make the space even more inclusive than it is. Um, aside from that, um, I think maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, I will say from, aside from my experience as a woman, uh, generally my experience in digital science is that uh, coming from a computer science background, um, in the projects that I'll venture in, I'll realize that I do not have the domain knowledge. So maybe I'll be given a project on agriculture, but I don't know much about agriculture. So it will push me to do a lot more research, a lot more reading. And I realized that I needed to be a bit more open into learning because um, our projects here are very diverse, as Chakaya had mentioned. So being open to learning and also having that curiosity to always try out different things has definitely um, put in the most into my growth in the data science field. 
Um, it was also that whole uh, aspect where I did feel that I had a bit of imposter syndrome, but I'll say I found a way to curb it. So when I looked at my undergraduate uh, project that I did, it was on sentiment analysis to uh, view the impact um, of the shift from traditional learning to online learning. Looking back at the work that I did, it was not that bad, but looking at if I was to redo the project right now, I can see there's a whole different field that I left out that I could have definitely explored. So seeing that made me realize that I have grown so much and my skills have definitely gotten a lot better. So it was very nice to just look back at the projects that I've done before to see how I would, I would approach them now and realize that there's definitely been a huge growth. But aside from that, I'm grateful to have a community where I can be able to speak about my experiences or any challenges that I have, and also getting a mentor for mentors who are able to give me advice where I, I require, as well as um, areas where I can improve. So maybe sometimes you might feel stuck, but having that mentor or person that you can speak to is definitely very important. So I also try to do that as well. Um, as, as, as mentioned, uh, we have the Smart Academy. So I try to at least find a way to mentor future data scientists. Uh, yeah, so that's all for my presentation. Uh, also, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Maria. That's a really lovely uh, last slide to uh, finish on for the presentation. And I can see that was actually created by Dali Ting. Is that right? The AI? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really nice touch. Um, and really interesting hearing again about the power of women supporting other women and, you know, not pulling up the ladder and mentorship. Um, so now I think we are on to our final talk um, from Natalie Zelenka from the Jean Golding Institute. So Natalie joined the team uh, Jean Golding Institute as the data science specialist in August 2018. Her main responsibilities at the Institute include helping researchers at the university with data science queries through the Ask JGI service and carrying out data science projects. After completing her first degree in maths and physics at the University of Manchester, she moved to the University of Bristol to study a PhD in computational biology, um, which she is currently finishing. Um, her research focuses on predicting human phenotype and protein function using clustering and outlier detection methodologies. And I think Natalie is actually a doctor now and has finished. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Natalie, and I'll, I'll make sure that I make you a co-host so you can share your slides. Great, thank you. Yeah, I have a lot of um, things that appear, so I thought it would be too um, mean to make Jody click that much. So let me just share my slides. Oh, um, I'm just doing yeah. it now. Cool. <laughs> a bit of a time delay. Yeah, yeah, I've got it now. Thank you. Um, I want to pick just the PowerPoint. Cool. Um, and let me start it. This is the normal one. Right, okay. Can you which one can you see? The normal slides? Yep, it's yeah. adventures in interdisciplinary data science. Cool. Um, hi, so yes, I'm Natalie Zlenka and I'm a data scientist at the Jean Golding Institute. Um, and I feel like uh, my first slide has already been expertly covered by uh, Chiara, but yeah, I did my um, undergraduate in maths and physics. And while I was there, I did a lot of kind of um, mathematical biology and, and sort of SIR models. Um, and and kind of modeling biological systems with 
equations, basically. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. And that is why I came to the university to do my PhD in computational biology. Um, and that kind of took quite a long time because I was simultaneously working here for some of it. Um, but it has been finished now for a little while, which is great. Um, and soon I will be moving on to UCL, where I will be working in health data science. So kind of um, the same, but going back a little bit to my kind of PhD uh, roots a little bit more. So I feel like my favorite thing about data science, and I guess why I picked math in the first place, is that it can be applied to so many different things. Um, and that's what I've been really lucky to be able to do in this job. Um, but I'm just going to talk about two um, things that I've worked on while I have been here at Bristol. Um, so the first one is called Philip, and that is one of those um, bad science names where it stands for something that you could never tell it stands for, um, which is filtering protein function predictions. Um, and I'm just going to give you a very uh, like whistle stop tour of molecular biology so that that means something to you. <laughs> so. There's DNA in every cell in our bodies. Maybe we already knew this part. Um, this is the, the, on the left, there's the kind of original model that they made of DNA. And this is uh, my interpretation on the right. Um, and this DNA that's in every cell of our bodies has about 20,000 genes. And these are parts of the DNA um, that are used as blueprints to build proteins and proteins are what do everything in our body. Um, so they make up our cells, uh, they make up like all of the really complicated molecular machinery that does things like replicates DNA and um, they signal, you know, what your other proteins should be doing. So for example, hormones are proteins. Um, and this is a, what protein might look like. And um, in all of the different cells in our bodies, different genes are, are switched on and off. So even though we have all of these genes in every cell, uh, different ones are switched on and off. And that's why um, your ear looks different to your lungs and does different things, um, because different stuff is going on in there with your, with your genes and with your proteins. Um, and so, for example, at a, at a bigger scale, these um, these proteins can cause different um, traits. So this is um, a picture of Mendel's P experiment, um, and he basically showed um, that you, if you cross um, a like pink or a purple uh, P flower and a white one, you'll get a generation of uh, ones that are just um, purple. But then um, they still are kind of holding on to this information somehow, because in the next generation, you can get a mixture. Um, and we would really like to know in humans um, what all of our proteins do in the same way as we know, you know, which proteins make a pea flower um, white or purple. Um, and the reason that would be so useful is because um, it's useful for um, diagnosis and healthcare. So people with rare diseases, for sometimes it can take them, you know, 20 or 30 years to be diagnosed with the right um, uh, disease. And then that really can um, affect having access to the right treatment um, or, you know, not being given the wrong treatment. Um, and so that is kind of what I was trying to work on is, um, predicting what proteins do. So the way that people generally do that is that they, um, they um, try and figure it out by using either the sequence of DNA or the structure of the protein. So this is kind of like a sort of the structure of the protein. Um, so for example, you might want to try and find um, a protein, like an unknown protein that is like similar structure to one we do know about and um, then you might say oh yeah that probably does the same thing because it is the same shape um, and what you get out of that is um, a link between a, um, a protein and a trait so we might say oh this protein um, causes uh, or affects your chance of getting lung cancer um, 
And th these methods are quite successful, but the only, uh, well, not the only problem, but one big problem with that is that that protein might never be actually created um, in the lung. So, um, which makes it not a very good uh, prediction um, because it would never get the chance to cause lung cancer because it never gets created there. Um, maybe this protein is only ever created like in the ear and therefore it's never going to do this um, lung cancer causing process that you're predicting. Um, so that is what I was doing when I made Philip, which is a filter for protein function predictions. It takes in all of these prote um, protein and trait pairs um, that are generated by a huge wealth of different um, phenotype and, and protein function predictors out there. And it filters those to take out the ones that are never expressed in the tissue of interest. Um, so this was a really big undertaking in the mapping exercise because um, it's not that easy to go from um, like the name of a um, trait to the um, to the data, the name of the tissue, um, and what I did to do that was to use biological ontologies. So just to briefly scare you, this is like what a small part of a biological ontology uh, would look like. Uh, so it's like a big knowledge graph. This is just a very tiny part, of course. Um, and you can extract information from that. Uh, for example, the lung is an organ. <laughs> this is something that you could extract, useful information like that. Getting rid of that now. Um, but anyway, I was really I wanted to talk about this one because I enjoyed uh, it worked out pretty well. Firstly, it worked out really well in the um, in terms of the number of the predictions that it got right. So 99.973%, which means which is actually uh, it got wrong 23 out of over 85,000 of uh, things it filtered out. Um, but what I thought was actually way more interesting than that was that all of these incorrect 23 um, filters were traits related to development and I didn't include data about developing tissues in the mapping so I'm pretty hopeful that I could push it even further. However, there is a downside uh, in that I need to improve the coverage, I need to map more of these um, traits to um, tissues and include more um, gene expression data um, because at the current uh, level even though it does a really good job of throwing out the wrong uh, predictions it's not enough to make a big dent on the overall success of um, the predictors that are going in. Um, I did want to say one extra thing about this um, which is that um, it, I think it's quite important to only use this kind of um, uh, technology on, um, on, on the types of um, traits that we might want to treat or that people do want to treat. Um, and I've just included a little uh, label here, which I will explain where this came from next, because this is the next project that I have worked on here at Bristol. So um, this uh, is the Data Hazards Project, and it's a project about the worst case scenarios of data science. So I think data scientists are really great at selling our work, for example, um, communicating efficiency and accuracy, um, like you probably just saw me do, um, but we're less well practiced in thinking about the ethical implications of our work, and actually I only put the label in at the end <laughs> because I was like oh I don't I haven't even used my own label um, so it really goes to show that we are less well practiced um, but the point of the project is to it's an open source project where anybody can suggest new labels suggest changes to labels and it covers a really broad um, range of ethics issues and data science so not just stuff that um, the institutional review board might um, help you with um, but also kind of wider societal impacts of, of data science and algorithms work um, and this is something that I've really enjoyed working on and we are launching version one of the labels at the end of this month 
So we're going to have an kind of an evening um, sort of party celebration event. Um, and if you are in Bristol, um, I will put a link in the chat or maybe Jodie can find it for me. Um, but it would be great to see people there. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was Data Ethics Club, which is a journal club I run about um, data science and ethics. Uh, we wrote a paper as well. Um, and we actually have our next um, meeting today. So we're talking this time about deep fakes, but we've, it runs every two weeks and it's very uh, casual and you can uh, just drop in and have a nice time. Um, Kiara asked me to include a slide on barriers that I have faced. And um, I think I've just been really lucky. So I've, <laughs> I've included barriers I have and haven't faced. Um, because I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, I had the barriers I haven't faced, but do exist. For example, I don't have any caring responsibilities. I don't do any teaching, so I don't have to have student evaluations, which I think probably most people know are, are, are quite sexist against women. Um, um, I had been so lucky in the Jean Golding Institute to have, a, you know, a, like the director is a woman. There's like been representation for me and I'm, I'm white and that obviously means there's more representation for me. Um, and I just, um, I, I get probably just through uh, luck, I have, always kind of fit in in a team of men because I like beer and coffee and computers so it's not like that's not I, don't, I shouldn't get any points for that um it's not fair and I think we have to kind of push back against those things um and I think in terms of in academia we see that um women sort of drop out before they become um like more senior leaders. And I haven't uh, got to that point in my career yet. So I haven't faced that barrier yet either. Um, there are also lots of things that I kind of, um, I kind of worry, I, I thought I might be judged for, but then I actually haven't been. And I thought it might be nice to mention those as well. Um, because I think there's one way of thinking about um, feminism as being like, oh, well, yeah, women don't have to do um, feminine things so because um, like kind of encouraged to act a bit more like a man um, but I think it's also nice to just not judge people for things like unhinged amounts of exclamation marks or you know being interested in ethics um, and I've never found anyone judgmental about that the barriers I have faced are like sometimes weird assumptions, like when I did join, I joined one team and they were like, oh, yeah, you'll probably like we can probably be like more caring and, and like make less rude jokes now. Like, is that my job? Uh, imposter syndrome, who doesn't have that? Um, and being asked to do kind of diversity tasks. Um, that's the other one. I do think that there's like loads of things we can do to make data, like science more bearable and like data science more bearable. And I think one thing is like picking things in your projects um, that make things better for other people. So like testing your code even and like sharing your data. And um, if you're writing a grant, like costing it enough to pay people properly <laughs> um, or sharing a code of conduct and making sure it's enforceable. Um, a thing I found really helpful is like just finding a community and like Data Ethics Club has been really helpful for that and that's one um, one reason I wanted to mention it. And I also wanted to say that there's lots of things that we don't have power over so, um, you know, policies about when teaching happens and if it's, and if there's flexible working and if there's um, promotion criteria that include the work that women usually do, those are things that we can only really like push against by like joining committees or in my case, like joining the union. Um, but I do think that, you know, there is lots of things we can do and that's positive. Um, and then I just wanted to finish by just saying that there's lots of women who inspire me, who I've worked with, um, 
who like really nice supportive mentors and, and management uh, peers and just other women in research and leadership that I look up to and I'm inspired by. Um, obviously this isn't everyone but these are some very lovely and talented um, people and yep that's it thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Oh, that was a lovely last slide. And um, I really enjoyed hearing about those three groups, the, uh, you know, the barriers and what you have and haven't faced. Uh, but it's good to have an awareness of general barriers that still exist for many. Um, so thank you. There's been some really fantastic presentations from a real range of different areas. And we're now moving on to questions and answers for the panel. And I believe, um, Song, you did put some questions in the chat box. Would you like to ask these questions yourself if you're still online? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so I'll just quickly uh, recap what I just said. I'm a supervisor of PhD students. Uh, and uh, so I basically have two questions. So one thing is, what do you think a supervisor should say to inspire female students? Because what I do realize is when we recruit PhD students, usually uh, we, we recruit much more, many more uh, male students than female students. So I wonder, you know, if I'm recruiting new student, new PhD student, what can I do or say to inspire uh, female student to join, uh, you know, the, the, our community, research community. Another thing is, uh, what do you wish your supervisors could have said to you uh, when you were a PhD student? Um, so, particularly about, you know, gender equality in academia or opportunities or disadvantages in uh, academia. So, those are my two questions. Thank you very much, Shara, for the uh, opportunity. I thank you very much for the great talks. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Son. So I think Ayaka, did you want to say something? Uh, okay. Uh, for the first question, um, I think it would be good to show some concrete example, especially one that breaks the typical image of women and also removes the psychological barriers against mathematical researches. Perhaps this may be specific to Japan, but there are uh, teachers who often talk about the story of Nightingale, uh, who is the Florence Nightingale. Uh, Nightingale is in Japan uh, strongly perceived as a nurse who devoted herself to people. Uh, an extremely free feminine person, but she is also a statistician. So this fact uh, uh, is very surprising for a, a female a student. And this story sometimes must uh, give some motivation for a female student to do uh, their research freely. So I think such uh, some good concrete example uh, will be useful to uh, encourage a uh, female student. Yeah, that's a great example. Did anyone else in the panel want to come in on that one? Okay. Um, and what about the second part, which is what um, do you think could have been said to you as a female to inspire you that maybe was, wasn't said or was said, you know, that, that you can find particularly inspiring? I mean, Maria, having your work in the Smart Academy, it would be interesting to hear your, your take on that and also the role of mentorship, a bit more about that. Uh, I will say that... Um... Usually I try to at least uh, hear maybe there's some certain uh, perspectives that each of my Smart Academy fellows have. So maybe I try to hear challenges that they may have and see how we can be able to 
um, work hand in hand to curb those challenges. And I try to also pair them with um, other BI analysts in our team who are a bit more uh, maybe close to what they are currently interested in working in. Uh, I'm not sure if that maybe answers your question. The question, yeah. So that's those are the two things that we do. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Natalie? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's it's for the first question, um, really, but um, one thing that I just think does tend to attract more um, female students to a project is, um, yeah, I do think that, like, if it's interdisciplinary in some way, that I think that can help quite a lot because when I did um, my undergrad in maths and physics, maths and physics were both like massively uh, male dominated, but in the maths and physics combined, it was 50-50 men and women. Um, and I don't know, that's just been my experience of like when I've suggested projects and things. I have a follow-up question, if it is possible. Sorry, did I speak uh, speak too much? Sorry, uh, Chair, no, do you want please, to move on? <laughs> please go on, go on, Sam. So, yeah, uh, just to follow up uh, Natalie's comment. Um, so, do you feel that uh, uh, women or female students uh, are are mostly um, sort of pushed to you know more applied research rather than uh, fundamental mathematical research? Because uh, you mentioned this kind of interdisciplinary um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, project, I wonder if it is a kind of uh, you know social norm to think that. Uh, um, yeah, men... I agree. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely not like women have to do. Inter there's nothing in biologically, you know. Um, but I think there might there might be some kind of like social bias for whatever reason. Um, I don't know. It'd be, I, I don't think another good thing to do would be to, if you're having a joint project, then um, having uh, the other supervisor be a woman would probably also help. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you, Sam, for that. And thank you for the panel. Um, Chika and I think um, Sarah mentioned being in groups where they were kind of 30% female and 70% male dominated. I mean, what advice would you give to women who find themselves currently in those situations at work or, you know, um, while they're studying? And um, yeah, uh, also you mentioned imposter syndrome. So do you have any strategies for dealing with that that have worked for you uh, personally? Um, check here. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. If I'm not wrong, you're asking how to deal with, for example, in my undergraduate, the male-dominated course, so how I dealt with um, that situation, yeah. So, first of all, I'd say that don't, don't fear, that just because it's a male-dominated field doesn't mean you're not going to prosper in it. And also, uh, the, you can, if the males in that course are, that's exactly. You can also use them to kind of, uh, you know, propel yourself. So don't don't afraid to ask for help. If it's a it's a male 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 colleague, male uh, male uh, classmates, just don't be afraid to reach out and ask them for help if you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice there. And, and Sarah, what would you say from an industry perspective? I guess. Um, I think on the industrial side, coming from an insurance company, uh, there is a very specific image that comes to the minds of most people in the UK about what it, what somebody working in insurance looks like. And it tends to not look like me or anybody on the panel. Um, you know, there is, there's a very, very typical um, approach. But in reality, you do find that most teams have a decent, I mean, not perfect, and not good enough, but a better distribution of different kind of kinds of people than you'd expect. And something that I think didn't really occur to me until quite late on in my degree was the fact that most people don't really think about the fact that they're in the majority. 
And so they're not thinking about the fact that you may be in the minority. When you're in the minority, it is painfully obvious that, you know, you're looking around at a sea of faces and nobody looks like you. But people in the majority aren't, in most cases, sitting there and going, oh, no, you don't look like me. You don't look like me. That's not something that comes through the heads of most people because of a state of privilege, realistically. And being able to sort of get that out of your head, which is far easier said than done, is puts you in a really powerful position because it does then enable you to, like Jakaya said, talk to the male individuals in your, your company, your team, your, your degree, whatever it might be, and learn from them and sometimes give them a bit of a reality check of, you know, you guys are in the majority and I personally am not. And that is how this impacts me. But at the same time, most people in the majority aren't paying enough attention to notice. And as, like I said, that, that can come with pros and cons, but where you can get out of your head to just see it as you are a person doing a thing and so are they, that can really put you in a more powerful position. A lot of the stuff where it comes down to, you know, how can we encourage women in different areas? There are some places where you can stray too much in the other end of hyper fixating on people who are in a minority of whatever area where, you know, oh, what support can I provide for this person? What, what can I do for this person? When in reality, most people in a minority are perfectly capable of getting on with whatever needs doing if they're allowed to do it. And I think that's a lot of what it comes down to is make sure that you, you know what tools you need to get stuff done. And if you're not getting those tools, that, that's one thing. But if you have those tools, kind of separating yourself from the idea of being in the minority can be incredibly powerful. Thank you, Sarah. That's actually a really good point. And it's a different way to look at it and to change your mindset, uh, to flip things around. Uh, it'd be an interesting experiment to kind of do internally and to reflect on. And um, yeah, I guess it depends, you know, what your team's like and what your wider team's like. But also there's something about, um, I think in Natalie's slide, um, finding your community and finding other people that you can speak to honestly and you can have as a critical friend. And you can even just have to chat to or vent to, because sometimes even when you talk to someone, you have someone to listen, you can feel a lot lighter afterwards. Um, but I think actually we've unfortunately come to the end of the session. It's gone far too quickly. I would have liked uh, much more time for questions and answers. But uh, thank you all. Um, thank you, Ayaka, Maria, Sarah, Jakaya, Elaine and Jody, the JDI team, Song, and everyone else who has joined us here today. It's been a pleasure hosting this and hearing about all your stories. Keep on inspiring and being the amazing women you are. And um, yeah, please um, fill in our feedback form in the chat box if you do have a chance today, because it will really help us to improve future events. Um, but that's all from us today. So thank you again, everyone. And I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye.